Now, IMF's fiscal monetary report released recently highlighted projections that Nigeria's debt-to-GDP ratio currently at 50.7% is expected to drop to 49.6% by next year. It noted that the country's public debt includes overdraft from the Central Bank of Nigeria and liabilities from the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, AMCON. Now, international finance and economic analyst Mukhtar Mohammed joins me now for more on this conversation. Good morning to you, Mukhtar. Thanks for joining us on Business Insights. Thank you for having me, Justin. All right, uh, IMF recently released um, a report on Sub-Saharan Africa. Let's start from there before we get um, down to Nigeria's um, specifics. Now, uh, it is projected that um, economic growth for the Sub-Saharan region uh, uh, has been forecasted for about 3.6% expansion this year and um, a further increase to 4.2% next year. You know, what are your thoughts, really? Because, um, I don't know, maybe I'm looking at it based on... Um, just um, Nigeria, but uh, it just goes beyond Nigeria, uh, you know, for to the sub-Saharan um, region. So, well, some expansion, 3.6 this year and 4.2 next year. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm um, just in, like you said, expansion has, has really done us any good. And again, we look at the expansion in terms of the in terms of raw materials that we take out, but what about the value that we create? The the um, um, and inability of, of sub-Saharan Africa, the infrastructural development of sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at that report very well, you realize that they say some of the things that are hindering growth in Africa has to do with infrastructure, to do with weak structural reforms, and even if they comment some reforms that are very difficult, thank God IMF and World Bank are beginning to know that some of these reforms being implemented are very difficult reforms. And so, Definitely, when you look at that space by what they are saying, then you are able to say, okay, fine, we, we can begin to see um, a little bit light at the end of the tunnel. But again, like we have said over the time, growth in terms of um, GDP has not really have so much positive impact because uh, of, 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 of the percentage of growth in terms of the GDP by and by the population of some of these countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So. Uh, there's still a lot to be done, and you, you can see those improvements, and it's tied to if some of the reforms that have been backed by some of these countries continue. Mm -hmm. And again, like you know, some of these reforms are facing their internal challenges at the moment. Speaking of um, um, reforms, because uh, the, uh, it actually noted that African countries, including Nigeria, are implementing necessary, but it, uh, it mentioned difficult reforms to restore the macroeconomic stability. We can imagine what uh, Nigerians are going through with all of the uh, so-called reforms the federal government is, uh, you know, dishing out to us by the day. But um, if I should quote, it said the fund stated that Sub-Saharan Africa still faces significant hurdles, including subdued growth tight financing and persistent social pressures. Let's talk about tight financing because most of the financing that we get are actually from the fund and the World Bank to meet some of our infrastructural, uh, maybe some of our social uh, pressure issues in the country. So far, how do you think um, the region has been able to circumvent around them its financing in terms of uh, what it takes and them also debt uh, servicing? You, you said, you know, uh, when they said about tight financing, I, I know they are talking about debt servicing because if you look at South Saharan Africa, debt servicing have, have taken uh, more of their budget and uh, come to Nigeria also at a point where we're doing about 97% in terms of debt servicing. Mm -hmm. Now I think we are doing about 60 something percent. Um, we are getting down gradually, but again, when you look at that, then the minimum for recurrent expenditure, there's nothing there for capital expenditure. So that cycle of debt continues again. So, so those are the tight finances they're talking about. That is in terms of government they are running getting some of their project on ground it's also tight financing on that type of financing they didn't talk about it's also how to do with uh, businesses also yeah. it's part of the tight financing because you talk about hiking um, interest rate it's causing a lot of destructions into businesses right smes that means they have to pay more for funding um they also have um, also have to do with um, um um uh, and bank banks also non-performing loans going up by the day because of uh, issues that have to do with um, um, um structural uh, reform especially hiking interest rates also and then any ability so some of uh, any abilities of most of the citizens of these countries especially nigeria they are not able to to earn more to buy some of these goods so they are not able to service their debt so 
tight finances both in the private and in the public sector is one strong uh, issue that is hindering growth in sub-Saharan Africa, in Nigeria, and, and other, other developing economies. And I, I think that is why um, I, I think uh, I've been advocating that we should have an in-house, mm. in, in, in what I call country solution to your problem, rather than a textbook economy solution. Look at the precarity of your economy, begin to see how you can address some of those challenges using all orthodox men. Because I don't know what it's, what is the rationale behind behind having a, a reserve of about 40 point something billion dollars. And then you also uh, have your exchange rate hitting about 1,800. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't, it, it doesn't add value to the economy, especially when you have an economy that import driven, you are priding yourself that you will not intervene in the market. You have about four b forty billion dollars and again at the end of the day your exchange is almost hitting two thousand. I think it, we need to begin to find a balance in terms of listening to what the IMF are saying and listening mm -hmm. to what you are doing. Even if IMF have come out now and say that look, we did not tell Nigeria to remove subsidy, we did not tell them to do but yet I think some of the decision they took is the right decision. But you and I know that they've been the one advocating for removal of some of these subsidies for a very long time yeah. in, in electricity and in in, 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 in in petrol. So, and it happened now, and they are not shifting the burden. I know we didn't tell them. So that tells you why we say that as a country, you must look at the precarity of your challenges and begin to address it. All right. Still speaking about um, the challenges that the IMF also talked about um, persistent social pressures. But let's look at it vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, Africa's or Sub-Saharan Africa uh, uh, labor, force, uh, labor force, we seem to have an um, emerging young population who um, have been able to harness uh, you know, technology and um, fintech you know, to grow you know, the economies of their states. So how do you think um, the countries in the region or the sub-region can actually harness the young or the youthful population or its labor force to project some of this growth that we are talking about? Justin, the good thing is not, it's not rocket science and it's something that is doable. But it has there has to be a coalition between coalition between both I mean the sub Saharan Africa to be able to achieve that. Mm. And then individual countries also have a role to play. We're talking about the vibrant young youth in terms of fintech, then you, you just have to talk about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. How much infrastructure do they have? When you talk about infrastructure, then you talk about the cost of that infrastructure. Because what drives a business itself is how you are able to manage costs to create more employment and to, to, to make profit. So now when you look at infrastructure, you look at internet connectivity, you like you look at uh, power, then you look at interconnectivity in terms of road network. Then, then you, you look at telecommunication in terms of internet connectivity also. You realize that all these areas are suffering with their own challenges in one area. Let's give a, an example of Nigeria. Internet connectivity is very, very difficult in the rural area. And these are areas that the fintech can really bring them back to the financial space. We're talking about financial inclusion. But if you don't have technology in that space, then it's, it's not going to, 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 to be successful. And then putting up technology in that space also is capital intensive. So infrastructure is one thing that the government should need to, to, to work on. Then you talk about exchange volatility is still there mm -hmm. because most of this infrastructure are not what is being manufactured or produced here in Africa. They have to be imported from developed ec economy of the world. So that also comes with its own challenge. A transportation, like I talked, interconnectivity within the sub-Saharan Africa is very, very difficult. Getting a flight from Nigeria to Ethiopia, for instance, is, is as difficult. You, have to, you may have to go to Kenya. From Kenya, you have to go to Ethiopia. So all these interconnectivity also are challenges that Africa need to deal with. But I think the major, major challenges have to do with rising cost of energy, uh, power, to making electricity available, and then energy cost, which is going high by the day because of issues that are beyond their own control, sometimes FX rates, sometimes international market politics and all that. So there's still a lot of work to be done. But I think majorly, African countries need to think, if you want to enhance the, 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 the variability of your population, the youth, um, the youthfulness of your population, then you have to build infrastructure. In building infrastructure, you have to think of energy, you have to think of power, and then you have to also think of telecommunication. 
All right, let's, let's just uh, bring it closer home for the last few minutes of our um, discussion right now. We know our struggle with um, debt financing. It's been a challenge over the years. Uh, but the IMF is actually projecting that um, right now our debt to GDP ratio stands at 50.7%. They say it's expected to drop. I don't know how they got your projection, you know, to about 49.6% by next year. But what do we do? I'm thinking of how we can actually find a way of striking the balance because the bulk of our revenues is, like you have um, mentioned several times, is used to service um, debt payment. How do we reduce um, the share of revenue allocated to debt service? And uh, I know we've talked about, uh, you know, increasing the tax net and all that because we need to really focus more on the revenue side. I know just how we can actually, you know, make it um, a bumper one so that we'll not just be expending everything that we are making on just paying back debt. Just there's a challenge when you talk about revenue, when you talk about widening the tax bracket in Nigeria, yeah. sometimes widening the tax bracket is taxing the already tax. And if you look at the tax reform committee, you know, I've praised that committee thus far, and I keep saying that that's the best committee Mr. President ex yeah. uh, 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 um, inaugurated. But again, when you look at that again, you look at the debt servicing, like you said, it's a big challenge. You look at that committee widening of tax bracket. When in Nigeria, when they say they are widening the tax bracket, sometimes it's taxing the already tax. <laughs> That's what I think. Like now they are thinking of widening the tax bracket. They are thinking of taxing the rich the more, mm -hmm. and so that is their own sort of widening the tax bracket. Nobody's coming up with ingenious way of getting the informal sector, which mm -hmm. I think is one of the most vibrant sector in Nigeria. Until we get them into that space, and the tax bracket will continue to widen this tax by taxing the already tax. Mm -hmm. That is one. And and secondly, again. When you when you talk about uh, GDP, when you see they say GDP coming down, it gives room. Sometimes the challenge I have is that it gives room for most African government, especially Nigeria, to begin to think of borrowing more because they tell you the tax to GDP is good, is good, but they are not looking to tax to revenue, and that has been the challenge. Uh -huh. I for one have been crying that stop looking at the tax to G I mean debt to GDP, to start GDP looking at the, the revenue because it's not the GDP that will pay; it's the revenue that will pay uh -huh. your 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 debt. So you begin to look at how much of your revenue are you going to be servicing and from using for debt servicing, and that is a big challenge. So let's leave the GDP on out of it. Look at your revenue, post your revenue, and see. How much of that you can use in, in, in investing in key uh, key areas of your economy? So the area of looking at the, the coming down. When you say the debt to GDP, is the, the debt to GDP is coming down. That you are saying, okay, Nigeria is is, is paying off some of its its, its uh, uh, um, debt obligation, but yet its revenue is not um, I mean, giving more room to also um, borrow more or because but its revenue is not improving. So. I think what we should be thinking as a nation is how do we improve our revenue base? And improving our revenue base, we must make sure we don't kill some of our businesses with high taxes. Because again, these days, like I keep saying, tax has gone beyond just revenue. It has been begin to be used as a tool to grow the economy. And that's why I said, if you look at some of the recommendations from the tax reform committee, you realize where they say if you have a turnover of less than 100 million, then you, you should be exempted from tax. Those are part of what I think um, we should be looking at. But I think basically, as a government in Nigeria, I would advise that we should also be taking looking at using tax to grow our economy and also looking at how we can reduce our expenditure. And one of those ways, when you look at some of these projects that have been embarked by government, sometimes this project could be a PPP, public-private partnership. Government provide the structure, build and operate for the next 25 years. So that government will have more fun to, to to invest in social investment. So for me, that is the way to go if you really want to build your economy and reduce your over dependent on borrowing money, reducing your debt profile. All right, thank you so much. I'm well said, the Mukta. I just uh, hope the government, of course, not just in Nigeria but um, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, are listening and um, they actually make um, this. Uh, useful insight that we have uh, provided on the show today. Many thanks once again, Mokta Mohammed, International Finance and Economic Analyst. We do appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Justin. All right. Well, that's the size of the show for today. My name is Justin Akadunye. Many thanks for being there. See you again next time. Bye for now. <laughs>